line 86. <clears throat> and I realized I've got to go a lot faster. Uh, this is why it usually takes me like five weeks to get through Beowulf. A bold demon who waited in darkness wretchedly suffered all the while. For every day he heard the joyful din loud in the hall with the harp sound, the clear song of the show. Okay. Notice what makes Grendel suffer. Sound of joy and revelry in the hall. He said, who was able, that is the show, the person singing the song, of the origin of men that the Almighty created the earth, the bright and shining plain, by seas embraced, and set triumphantly the sun and moon to light their beams for those who dwell on land. Kind of sounds like Cadman's hymn. I don't know that the Beowulf poet was aware of Cadman and Cadman's hymn, but it sure sounds a lot to me like this is an allusion to Cadman's hymn. Okay? And so we're told, Thus this lordly people lived in joy, blessedly, until one began to work his foul crimes. A fiend from hell. Now again, does that literally mean Grindel is a demon, a demonic spirit from hell? No. Probably not. This grim spirit was called Grindel, mighty stalker of the marches. Well, here's a place where you need some definition. What are the marches? Borders. He dwells in the borderland. Okay? He is called a, in just a few minutes, a march stopper, a border walker. So what does that tell us about Grindel? <clears throat> He's an outsider. He has no home to speak of, in the sense that Anglo-Saxons understand and value home. He has no hall, per se, other than the underground cave that he shares with his mother. You know, could explain why he's so grumpy. <laughs> this grim spirit was called Grindel, mighty stalker of the marches, who held the moors and fins. This miserable man lived for a time in the land of giants. Okay? After the creator had condemned him among king's race. When he killed Abel, the eternal Lord avenged that death. Okay? So, Cain kills Abel and creates a feud, opens a rift between himself and God. So what does God do? God avenges Abel. How? Not by killing Cain, but by marking him and sending him out of Eden. No joy in that feud. That is, Cain didn't receive any joy in that feud, nor the descendants of Cain. The maker forced him far from mankind for his foul crime. So from Cain arose all misbegotten things. Trolls and elves and the living dead. Okay, One of the words that is used in the manuscript are the Orkneus. It's where Tolkien gets orcs from. Okay. Trolls, elves, the living dead, and the giants who strove against God. So, we've heard that the poet, that Herod is now created. And then the poet immediately brings in, this hall is going to be destroyed by family strife. And then we get introduced to Grendel. And we find out Grendel is a descendant of and family strife, essentially. When night descended, he went to seek out the high house to see how the ring names had bedded down after their beer drinking. We don't know how long after Herod is open that Grendel first attacks. It's possible it's the first night. It's possible that he has to build up, you know, a head of steam of anger after months or years. But he goes and he finds the Danes after what? Their beer drinking. Now, the poet is going to say a couple of things about the Danes and beer drinking. They drink too much. <laughs> because we're actually going to hear Beowulf talk about their drunkenness. Okay? 
And what does he do? He finds therein a troop of nobles asleep after the feast. They knew no sorrow or human misery. Why? Why don't they, the troop of Danes, asleep after the feast, not feel any sorrow or human misery? Because they are totally wasted. I mean, they are just plastered. So they don't have sad thoughts? I mean, a lot of my friends. Well, <laughs> but not when they're asleep. Not when they're so drunk they're passed out. That's how these guys are. That's, I think, the import of they knew no sorrow or human misery. They're, they're dead to the world, but they're not literally dead yet. Okay? The unholy creature, grim and ravenous, was ready at once. And what does he do? He takes 30 men. One creature takes 30 men. Okay? He goes back to his home, and we're told just before dawn, Grindel's warfare was made known, and what does Hrothgar do? Does he suit up in his armor? Is it now, you know, you know is it like Clint Eastwood, it's halftime in America, and it's time for the second half? No. Unhappy sat the mighty Lord. Long good nobleman, suffered greatly, grieved for his things. <coughs> that strife was too strong, loathsome, and long. He sits down and has a pity party. <coughs> Woe is me. This is not dramatic. <laughs> this is not the way a lord reacts. The way a lord reacts is, give me my horse, and give me my sword, and give me my shield, because I'm going to go kick Grendel's you-know-what. Hrothgar acts like Job in the book of Job. He sits down, woe is me, okay? In the very next night, Grindel comes again. And we're told, he mourned not at all for his feuds and sins. He doesn't care, okay? Then it was easy to find a thane who sought his rest elsewhere, farther away, in other words, eh, men are getting a little leery about spending the night in Herat. They'll spend the night in the outbuilding outside Herat, or in a barn, but not Herat itself. Okay? Line 144. So he ruled. Who's the he? Uh-uh. Grindel. And strove against right. One against all, until empty stood the best of houses. Now, it's not during the day that Grindel rules. It's at night. Every night, you know, they see the sun coming out. So, uh oh, time to leave. Grindel's coming. And they leave, and Grindel comes. Until every evening, the hall stands empty. Well, what's the purpose of the hall? To gather people together. So it is not being used according to its design. And what do we hear? For 12 long winters, this happens. That doesn't mean only winter. <laughs> it's winter, spring, summer, fall, all year long. This happens for 12 years. The Lord of the Shielding suffered his grief, every sort of woe, great sorrow. Why? Why is it even more great sorrow? Because word is being spread about Hrothgar the Great, who can't even sleep in his own hall at night. Okay? It's bad enough when you're a failure at something, right? It's just compounded worse when everybody knows you're a failure at something, especially when you've been really, really good before. It's like, you know, I, I'm not even a football fan, but, you know, it's like Tom Brady winning the first three football world um, Super Bowls he goes to, and then the next two he goes up against Eli Manning, and he loses both of them. It's like, you know, Grindel's in the house somewhere, right? <laughs> and we're told, Grindel, line 155, 
Grendel wanted no peace with any man of the Danish army, nor ceased his deadly hatred, nor settled with money. Settled with money is talking about where guild. Where means man. Guild, I mean, literally, it's gold. But it means payment. See, you can settle a feud nonviolently if you want to play, you know, Mahatma Gandhi. The way you do that, you pay the person for the crime that you committed. So if you accidentally kill some guy's ox, there were actually scales of payment for what it would cost for that kind of crime. And there were scales of payment for what happens if you killed a serf, a peasant, or what happens if you killed a free man, or what happens if you kill a member of the nobility, or what happens if you kill the king. Rising scale. Peasant was fairly cheap. King, you pretty much couldn't pay the fee. Okay? So this is what it's talking about. Grindel doesn't want to do any of this. He doesn't want to negotiate. He doesn't want to sit down, have the UN come in, you know, none of that. Hmm. Nor did any of the counselors need to expect bright compensation from the killer's hands. Okay? That is, Hrothgar's counselors weren't sitting around saying, maybe we should send an emissary, see if he'd agree to pay this much amount. Why? For the great ravager relentlessly stalked. A dark death shadow lurked and struck old and young alike. Why should he stop? He's got the upper hand. He's in control. Then we get this long passage. Okay, that includes... The um, part we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes. Thus the foe of mankind, fearsome and solitary, often committed in many crimes. He occupied Herod in the dark nights, etc., etc. Okay? He scorned their treasures, we're told. He did not know their love. And notice the translation in the note. Thus the foe, something, something, love. This is a much disputed passage. This reading follows a suggestion made by Fred Robinson in Why is Grindel's Not Greeting the Giefstuhl a Rach Mitchell? That is, a great wretchedness, so-and-so, and repeated in Mitchell and Robinson's Beowulf. The problem is, in my opinion, it's wrong, this translation. Because what Roy has done, the poem says, line 166, he occupied Herod, the jewel adorned hall, in the dark nights, he saw no need to salute the throne. That's not what the manuscript says. The manuscript says he could not greet the throne. Okay. Well, what does that mean? You can walk in and go, hello, throne, how are you doing? No. It means he wasn't allowed to sit in the throne. Why wasn't he allowed to? Yes. Huge. Okay. He scorned the treasures. One second. Let me, um, Okay, come on, Sid. Where is it? Why 
line is that? 168. The Old English reads, No hethona yisto dretin mosta. Literally, not he, that throne to greet was able. Mavum for metoda. Treasures for God. <coughs> Nor his ne his mina wisa, nor his mind knew. And I'll put that in modern English. It's not he saw no need to salute the throne. No hethona gistol gretin mosta. He was not able to greet the throne. Why? Because he did not know the treasures. Of God. God stops him from taking a place in that seat. Okay? The throne is reserved for the king. And it is like Grendel comes up, and let's say the throne is that table. It's like Grendel comes up, boom, bounces off. He can't physically come up and touch it. Something stops him. Okay? The poet tells us it's God that stops him. Okay? He scorned the treasures. He did not know their love. Now, Leuza tells us he's following Mitchell and Robinson in their article. Or he's following Robinson in an article he wrote. And in the edition that Fred Mitchell, uh, Fred Robinson and Bruce Mitchell put out of bail. This is one of the reasons I do not use this edition in my graduate old English courses. Because one of the things Mitchell and Robinson attempt to do in their edition is they try to direct you to their interpretation. Okay? In their gloss, for, as an example. Their glossary does not give you as full a range of meanings for individual words as other glossaries do. And what they're doing is they're saying, no, 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 we don't want you to think about this possibility. We want you to go down this line. Okay? And so I wish, really wish he'd change that. That was deep misery to the Lord of the Danes, a breaking of spirit. Why? Grindel occupies the house all night long. So what are we told? Hrothgar, whose spirit is broken, doesn't know what to do. And so he and his counselors think and debate what they can do. And we're told, they sit, they talk, and line 175, at times, they offered honor to idols at pagan temples. The Old English there is, Huilam here you had an at harg travum. Harg travum is the word that gets defined or described as heathen temples. Okay? Here's a question for you. How can there be heathen temples in a place that does not know Christianity. There is no, in other words, heathen is a pejorative term. It is only used in distinction to Christian. Okay? It's the only time and way it can be used. At times they offered honor to idols at pagan temples. They prayed aloud that the soul slayer, what? Might offer assistance in the country's distress. Well, think of the logic of that. Who's the soul slayer? It's Satan. Why is Satan going to offer them any help? From Grindel, who's kind of like a general in Satan's army. Such was their custom. The hope of heathens. Okay, now this is what tells me, as I said earlier, it's a Christian author speaking to a Christian audience about a pre-Christian people. Pre-Christian not meaning before the birth of Christ, but pre-Christian meaning before Christianity has reached them. Okay? They remembered hell in their minds. How? They'd been there previously? No. They did not know the maker, the judge of deeds. They did not know the Lord God, or even how to praise the heavenly protector, wielder of glory. Now, a lot of people, including J.R.R. Tolkien, think this 
passage from about 175 through 188 is a passage that as the poem gets copied down over the years, Tolkien believed it was probably earlier rather than later. That is, 700 was a better date for composition of the poem than 900 or later. That as it gets copied down, some monk wants to go and Jesify it. Make it, make it all Christian-y. Okay? And so he throws in this passage. I think Tolkien's completely wrong. Because what the poet says here, the, the tone of it is throughout the poem. Listen to what else he says. After that comment about they didn't know how to properly praise God, etc., etc., we then get another gnomic passage. Woe unto him who must first thrust his soul through wicked force in the fire's embrace, that is, who must die when he doesn't want to die. That's the thrust his soul through wicked force. Man, that's hard to say. Um, and must thrust it into the fire's embrace. What fire? Hell. You know, there used to be, where the graduate studies now is across the street, there used to be a Baptist church there, Middle Tennessee Baptist. And when I first started here, they had a big bus that had flames painted on the side of the bus, and it had a motto on it, something, I'm sorry if any of you are from attend that church, it had something like, you know, saving people one soul at a time from hell. I mean, the idea that that suggests is that everyone is naturally in hell, and that therefore you must be pulled out, rather than the opposite idea, okay? Listen to what this speaker says. Woe unto him who must thrust his soul through wicked force in the fire's embrace. Expect no comfort. No way to change at all. Okay? Expect no comfort. Now the speaker is saying expect no comfort, no change at all. Two, it, it's implied in two places. That is, that implies, or that applies, after one is in the fire's embrace. Hell is supposed to be an eternal place, right? Okay. And before. The person who goes to hell doesn't expect any change. Doesn't look for any salvation or redemption or possibility of change. Now this is going to be important because in just a few lines we're going to find out. This is what Hrothgar is thinking. Hrothgar's thinking, there will be no end to this. Grindel will be with me the rest of the days of my life. Okay? But, it will be well for that kind of person. It shall be well for him who can seek the Lord when? After, After his death day. And find security in the Father's embrace. Now, you will find, not find, you will not find that idea in many Christian churches today. Because what is the poet saying? You can be saved after, after, after you die. It's not turn or burn. Now. <laughs> I mean, one of the great pitches is, do you know what's going to happen if you die tonight? What happens if you die tonight and you haven't turned? Then you burn, you know, for all eternity, a marshmallow, <laughs> just ever, you know, for wormwood to eat, you know. No, this poet says, it will be well for him who can seek the Lord after the death day. That is, that you can die and still seek what? Salvation. Or... A change. What does the word repent mean? Change. To change. To turn. It literally means to pull 180. To change direction. Okay? And find security in the Father's embrace. Now, I think, whoever the poet was, that the poet was illiterate. The poet was able to read and write. And the poet knew some works. And one of those works would probably be 
Dialogues of Gregory the Great. Okay? Pope Gregory talks about, in one of his dialogues, I'm pretty sure it is, talks about having had a vision of the Emperor Trajan, the Roman Emperor Trajan. Go to Paris, you can see Trajan's Colony and all that kind of cool stuff. I think it's Paris. But Trajan burning in hell. And Trajan asking for help. Okay? And Gregory prays for him. After he's Pope. And prays for him, and prays for him, and prays for him, and prays for him. And through Gregory's prayers, another vision, Trajan is released from hell. Now, for most of us who have any idea of hell, the idea of hell means permanent mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Well, it wasn't that way to the early church. Because the early church looked at Christ's death, resurrection, and everything, that bef after the death but before the resurrection, something happened. A little event called the harrowing of hell, where Christ went down into hell, and he didn't just go, Hello, Mr. Satan, can I have all the good people, please? But he goes down and he obliterates the gates of Hades. Now, if he obliterates the gates of Hades, what does that mean? There's nothing to keep them there except <coughs> themselves. And the only ones who stay are the ones who want to stay. But everybody else, come on out. Okay? Yes? I'm trying to form my question. Um, so I guess with the whole translation and interpretation of Beowulf, those same principles can apply to the Bible. Oh, sure. And because it just makes me wonder why that's not what you just said isn't taught more um, or at all. I mean, I've never heard that in a church. Yeah, it's... Um, I mean, you read a lot of the, the writings of the early church. You read writing, and not just the Bible, but you read writings of the church fathers, for example. Um, and there is, I mean, there is debate about this, but many of them come on the side of, for example, you know, you have numerous references in Scripture of Christ, you know, what does he do? What does he say to Peter? Against this rock, what will the gates of hell do? Not prevail. That is... Against the church, the gates of Hades cannot do anything. And there's all kinds of stuff about who did Christ come to save? All mankind. Who does God love? All, it's not, you know, I came to save, you know, you and you, you and you. I used to be Presbyterian, but I'm not anymore. You know, so you get predestined and you get predestined and you get predestined and the rest of you are damned. Right? Well, thank you. <laughs> no matter how good you are, how nice you are, how you know you help the poor, you treat them, you still do. Okay. So it seems to me that this poet is familiar with the writings, if of nobody else, probably of Gregory, because otherwise it would be no. You choose now, because the choice must be made now. But there are a lot of early writers of the church who say, no, no. You can die. And it's at that point, ultimately, that you acknowledge the reality or you say, the hell with you, <laughs> which really means the hell with me. You know? and, and again, even in the, let me throw this out there also, even in the early church and in a lot of the church still today, what is hell? It's not a place physically away from God. It's being in the presence of God. If you don't want to be in the presence of God. I mean, what would be more hellish than that? I mean, think, think of the Christian story. Satan wanted to be above God. What would be more hellish than having to be in the very, hmm, <laughs> with God when you're like, but I'm going to be over you. Sorry. <laughs> Not going to work that way. That's pretty bad. Okay. So, we're told that little passage, and then we get, but the sorrows of that time, the son of Hathane seethed constant, constantly. What does it mean to seethe? Come on, I'll bet everybody in here 
has at one point or another in your life just see, like, seemed. I think of seeds with anger. Yeah. You know, yeah. You're just so uh-huh. eaten up with it. Exactly. Eaten. You are consumed. But he's consumed with what? Sorrow. Grief. Poor, pitiful me. Nor could the wise hero turn aside his woe. Well, we just heard language about turning aside, expecting a change. He can't bring about any change. Well, why not? We find out later, he's old. He's really old at this point. He had 50 years of peace before Grindel came. So he's at least 50. Let's say that peace began when he was born. It doesn't work that way. Let's say the peace began after he became king. You could assume maybe he becomes king at 20. It's a little young. Let's say he's 30 when he becomes king. And he becomes king, and he has 50 years of peace. So that makes him 80 when Grendel comes. And then Grendel comes and rules for 12 years. Makes him 92. (laughs) But the math's not right. Because we're we're going to find out he doesn't have 50 years of peace before Grendel comes. He's going to say, I've ruled for 50 years, but for the last 12 years, Grendel has been here. So Grendel came in his 38th year of ruling, and he's now 80. He's going to put his teeth in in order order to talk, (laughs) seemingly. This is why he can't do anything. It's why he's a wise hero and not a strong hero. All right? Too great was the strife, long and loathsome, which befell that nation. Then we get introduced to the strong hero. Then from his home, the Thane of Helak, a good man among the gates, heard of Grindel's deeds. He was of mankind, the strongest of might in those days of this life. So we have someone who's very weak, who can't turn anything around, juxtaposed with the strongest man in the world. Hercules, Achilles, you know, pick your ancient Greek hero. And what does he do? He commands to have a ship made ready. He's going to go across and he's going to help Hrothgar. So we're going to skip a little bit. And they make their sea journey. And line 229... The Shielding's Coast Guard, the watchman, sees them coming. And he watches them land. He sees the men come down the gangplank, gangplank, loaded for bear. I mean, just armed to the teeth. And he's like, who are these guys? Who do they think they are landing on my territory? They haven't asked. And so he rides his horse down to the shore. It says, what are you, warriors in armor, wearing coats of mail, who have come to sailing, blah, 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 blah. He says, I've been the Coast Guard for a long time, and I've never seen warriors like you. What does he mean by that? Oh, you guys are good. I could tell how you carry yourselves. I could tell by your armor. You are not to be trifled with. And there's one in the middle of you. He's not a common shield bearer. Because it's like Beowulf stands head and shoulders above everybody else. Okay. I have line 247. I have never seen a greater earl on earth than that one among you, a man in war gear. That is no mere courtier, unless his looks belie him. So, tell me who you are and why you're here, he wants to know. And Beowulf, the oldest, steps forth and says, We are men of the Gatish nation, he likes hearth companions. Okay. Helax hearth companions means we are the closest to King Helak of the gates. We're not just mere, you know, um, infantrymen. We're not grunts, in other words. My father was well known among men, a noble commander named Edgethal. And when he says that, there's almost an implication. 
If I were to make a film of Beowulf, which I can guarantee you would be better than any other film that's ever been done, <laughs> they're all horrid. When he says that, he would kind of go, come on, you've heard of Edge Thou. Everybody's heard of Edge Thou. He saw many winters before he passed away, ancient from the court. Nearly everyone throughout the world remembers him well. Now that's a little sop to the guy saying, you do remember my father, correct? Because if you don't, then you must be a nobody. All right? He says, we've come to help the son of Halfdan. We've heard about the hidden evildoer. Sounds like George Bush. <laughs> in the dark nights, you know, manifests his terrible and mysterious violence. He says, I've come to bring counsel to Hrothgar. Notice, to advise him how, line 278, wise old king, he may overcome this fiend if a change could ever come for him. Well, what kind of change? A reversal of fortunes. We already, we heard the poet address that very idea about the one who has to have his soul thrust into the fire. Okay? So the watchman says, you know, a wise officer has got to be a judge of character. Sharp shield warrior must be a judge of both things, words and deeds, if he would think well. What that means is he has to be able to listen to what somebody else says and determine, can he do what he says he can do? Because if he can't, he might be a liar, might be a spy. If he can, then you have to pay attention to it. But he says, I trust you. So he leads them on to Herod. And they make their way to the hall. Line 333. And a proud warrior says, says, whence do you carry those covered shields? I'm herald and servant of Hrothgar, and never have I seen so many foreign men so fearless and bold. Who are you? And we're told, we're here like board companions again. Now he tells us his name. Beowulf Isminama, he says in the Old English. And he says, I, I want to explain to the son of Halfdane why I'm here. And so Wolfgar, the guy who's been speaking, says, okay, I'll tell Hrothgar. He goes in and tells Hrothgar, there are men from the gates. One of them is named Beowulf. They've requested an opportunity, opportunity to speak to you. And he goes, man, you ought to see these guys. They look fearsome. I, you know, personally, I'd let them in if I were you. Okay? And Hrothgar says, I knew him when he was young. <laughs> He knew Beowulf when he was a boy. His old father was called Edgedale, to whom Hrethel the Gate gave in marriage his only daughter. We had half Dane in his lineage up. Hrethel also has four children, three sons and a daughter. I have to make sure I get the names right. She marries Edgedale. They have Beowulf. Okay, so Helak is his mother's brother. Okay. Now his daring son has come here, sought a loyal friend. Seafarers, in truth, have said to me. Remember earlier I said the leader, Terry, that there are elements within the story that tell us that there are stories of Beowulf? Seafarers have said to me, those who brought to the gates gifts and money as thanks, that he has 30 men's strength, strong in battle, in his hand grip. Stories about Beowulf have preceded Beowulf's arrival. He has the strength of 30 men in each hand grip. Well, isn't that fortunate? Because Grindel carried off 30 men his first night. <laughs> Holy God. 
And the manuscript actually says, uh, Holy God. <laughs> Holy God. It's not, you know, wondrous all father, great spirit of the sky. It's this is very Christian language. Holy God in his grace. The old English is I would translate more as favor has guided him to us. Cuz in his grace almost sounds a little too reformed, let's say has guided him to us against Grindel's terror. He says, I'm going to offer him treasures for his daring. Let him come in. Okay. So he's heard about Beowulf, and he says, God has sent him here. Woo! Talk about interpretation. Reading into events. I mean, Newt Gingrich kind of thinks God has put him on earth to be the whatever. Okay. <laughs> Beowulf doesn't say this about himself. Beowulf hasn't said, I've come because God put in my mind that I'm to be a savior for your people. He doesn't say anything. Yeah, that's more of <laughs> He doesn't say anything like that. Right? So Wolfgar sends them in. And we're told, line, skipping several lines again, 407. Beowulf comes in. Be well, Hrothgar. I am Helix Kinsman, young retainer. In my youth, I've done many a glorious deed. We're not told how old he is. I mean, if he's like 18, then what's his youth? When he was 10? Or is it more like he's 30 and in his youth, in his 20s? I think Baal's age is pretty important. This business with Grendel was made known to me on my native soil. Seafarers say that this beautiful hall stands empty every night so it's obviously daylight right he says my own people advise me the best warriors the wisest men that I should seek you out later on in the poem Helak is going to say the exact opposite Helak is going to say I begged you not to go I didn't want you to leave I was worried for you so what's the truth it, it can't be both it can't be, oh yeah, everybody advised me to go, and nobody advised me, advised me to go. Why? Because they knew my strength. They saw me, had seen me, bloodstained from battle, come from the fight. When I captured five, five what? The implication is five of the next thing that are mentioned. Giants! Slew a tribe of giants. In other words, he practiced giant side <laughs> okay and on the salt waves fought sea monsters by night survived that tight spot okay he says and now with Grindel I shall by myself have a word or two with that giant so he's killed sea monsters he's captured five giants he killed a whole tribe of giants what's Grindel? Grindel would be easy for Beowulf so he says I, I ask a single favor of you. Let us do this. Let me and my band of warriors cleanse Herod. Right? And he says, I shall grapple, line 439. I shall grapple with the fiend and fight for life, foe against foe. Let him put his faith in the Lord's judgment, whom death takes. That is, let him, whom death takes, put his trust in the Lord's judgment. Well, he sounds like a Christian. The only problem is, he doesn't know anything about Jesus, so he can't be a Christian. So what does he mean by Lord? The measurer. The measurer. Okay? The one who measures people's lives. I expect that if he will, if he's allowed to win, eat unafraid, the folk of the gates. <laughs> that is, if Grindel kills me, sorry guys. <laughs> My, you know, I'll be the appetizer and my men will be the main course. And you'll have no need to cover my head. Why? Because it won't be around anymore. <laughs> but if death does take me and any of my stuff survives, send it back to Helak. Like my corslet shirt, you know, that kind of stuff. Why? Because the corslet shirt is the work of Wayland, he says. Wayland the Smith. Great character in Germanic mythology. 
This is one of the very, very few references to a pagan element. Okay? He's not a god. He's a man, but he makes armor for the gods. And so Hrothgar says, okay, but let's talk about why you're really here, Beowulf. For past favors, my friend Beowulf, and for old deeds, you have sought us out. What? What past favors? Your father struck up the greatest of feuds when he killed Hitholaf by his own hand among the Wilvings. Now, some people interpret that to mean he killed Hitholaf as only one among all the other Wilvings that he killed. Or wolfings, if you want. I don't think that's what it means. I think he killed Hethelaf, who was a wolfing or wolfing. Okay? So he says, your father started a great feud. He killed a man. So what happens when you start a great feud? You either have to pay the wear guild or you suffer the consequences. And he says, when the waiter tribe would not harbor him for fear of war. Who's the waiter tribe? These guys. They're called the waiter gates. Okay? He's living with his wife's family, so to speak. So he kills a guy, he goes back to home, and they're like, hell no. <laughs> You're not staying here, because what's going to happen? The Wilvings are going to come after us. This isn't our, this isn't our battle. What about Duty to kin. Married kin, is that the same? It's an in-law thing. <laughs> yeah, it's an in-law outlaw thing. Okay. So he says, so he sought the South Dane people over the billowing seas. The honor shieldings. And one thing you have to get familiar with is you have people called by a whole bunch of different names. South Danes, that's Hrothgar's people. The honor shieldings. That's Hrothgar's people. Spear Danes, that's Hrothgar's people. Glory Danes, that's Hrothgar's people. Victorious, you get the idea. Okay? What the poet is doing is for alliteration purposes. Renaming all these people. Okay? So he says, Then, that is when your father came here seeking help, I first ruled the Danish folk and held in my youth this grand kingdom. Okay. I first in my youth ruled this kingdom. He's going to tell Beowulf in a few pages that how long has he now ruled the kingdom? Fifty years. So, let's say he's not talking it was fifty. Let's say, give him a few years. Let's say, you know, five years in. Let's say it was 45 years ago. He said, I knew Beowulf in his youth. Well, how did he know Beowulf in his youth? I think it can only be when his father and mother and him were brought here. So how old then does Beowulf become? Is he 40, 45? It just creates problems. Because Beowulf then still has to kill Grendel and Grendel's mother. And then he has to become king. And then he reigns for 50 years. And then the dragon comes. So when he gets ready to fight the dragon, is Beowulf pushing 100? <laughs> we know he's at least probably as old as Hrothgar is here. Which is 80. What's 20 more years? If you're a hero with the strength of 30 men in each hand. All right. So he says, I then first ruled the Danish folk. Haragar was dead, my older brother unliving. He was better than I. And he says, I sent treasure to the Wilfings. So I think it means that it's actually, it's closer to 50. The only other way I think he could have known Beowulf is if Beowulf was for some reason sent down to the land of the Danes to be like a foster son. But there's no indication in the poem of that. All right? So he says, I paid your father's debt. He paid the Wero Guild. 
The feud ended. Only now what has happened? Because I paid your father's debt, but his dad's dead. You owe me. That's why you've really come. See, Beowulf didn't mention any of that. Hrothgar goes, yeah, that's all nice and good. I know the real reason you came. The real reason you came is because you owe me. All right? And then he says, interestingly, after he says, your father swore oaths to me. Line 473. It is a sorrow to my very soul to say to any man what Grindel has done to me. Why is it a sorrow to his soul? Because Hrothgar is proud. I mean, he was a king of kings. He was one that people paid tribute to. People brought gold <coughs> from afar to help build and adorn this hall. And now, he has to tell others what Grendel is doing to him. Humiliated Herod with his hateful thoughts, his sudden attacks. My hall troop, my warriors are decimated. Weird has swept them away into Grendel's terror. Okay? So he's kind of blaming it on fate. And then he throws in this sentence. God might easily put an end to the deeds of this mad enemy. Well, sure he could. God could say, Grindel, don't be. And Grindel disappears. So he says, all this bad stuff's happening to me, and God could stop it if he wanted. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you want to? Why aren't you stopping it? What have I done? Right? Get the import of that. Now keep in mind, that comes after some of the earlier gnomic passages we've seen. God might easily put an end to the deeds of this mad enemy, but obviously he hasn't, so God's got a reason for allowing it to occur. Read Boethius. Often men have boasted, drunk with beer, officers over their cups of ale, notice that, drunk with beer over their cups of ale, that they would abide in the beer hall. Grindel's attack with his sword, rush of sword terror. And what happens? In the morning, they're coming in with the fire hoses and cleaning them out. <laughs> because everyone who does gets killed. So he says, but sit down, drink up. Now notice that. Grindel kills everybody when they are in what state? Drunk. Sit down, have a beer, have five. <laughs> He says, and I'll give you reward. So then this other character stands up. And this other character probably is literally sitting right at Prothgar's feet. Okay? So that we have, here's an image of the hall. Okay? The fire's you know, blowing in the middle. Or in the middle. And we have a, a seat over here. Okay, that Hrothgar is sitting on, and probably somewhere right down there, is um, Unfair. If you were looking down at it from the top, here's the fire. There are benches here, there are benches here, probably Hrothgar's seat here. Okay. Unfair would be sitting here. Beowulf and his men are standing here. All right. Hrothgar has nephews, has his own sons, okay, and his nephews there also. But Utfer stands up. We're told he unbound his battle runes. What does that mean? It means he picked a fight. Unbound his battle runes means his battle runes, his battle words, were bound up inside him. He's had enough of this upstart Beowulf that he can take. And he just launches into him. And he says... Are you the Beowulf we've heard stories of? And Beowulf's kind of like Captain Jack Sparrow. Well, but you have heard of me, right? Are you the Beowulf who what? Challenged Brekka to a swimming contest when you were both boys? That you would swim out on the wide blue ocean and you lost? You're that Beowulf? 
Okay? You toiled for seven nights and he outswam you, had more strength. He sought his own land, you lost. I expect a worse outcome from you if you try to take on Grendel. In other words, you couldn't even win a swimming contest. Okay, keep in mind, seven nights. We're not talking about a heated indoor pool. What, what is the territory that they live in? Is there a... Yeah, there's one. Um, this will give us a little idea. The, some of the things I'm going to email you will include some images, um, including a map. Uh, no, not projector. Computer. Show to class. Show to class. Okay. You have probably the land of the gates here. The wolfings here. Danes down here, Danes over here, here's the jutes and angles and such. Okay? So when Beowulf and Brecca do their little swimming contest, they may jump off here, and it's possibly over here or over here. This whole area of Sweden is called Gotland, G-O-T-H-L-A-N-D, or G-O-T-L-A-N-D, which some people think the G-O-T comes from the get. Okay? Let's assume they jump off over here. Where does Beowulf end up, from what he tells us? He says in the land of the Laps. That's Finland. It's off the map. It, it's, it's way up over here, between Finland and Russia. Okay, this is not warm water. This water, if I remember, it's like 42 degrees. And he's not swimming in a nice, you know, wetsuit. <laughs> What's he swimming in? Armor. With his sword. And he goes from here to up here. I once calculated it. If I remember it, it's like 500 miles. Okay? Pardon? In seven days. In seven days, in armor. <laughs> After he has to kill... Sea monsters, okay? So, Beowulf hears Unferth and says, What a great deal, Unferth, my friend, drunk with beer, you have said about Becca. In other words, I know your words are motivated by the beer. He says, you've only heard, like Paul Harvey says, most of the story. Now I'm going to give you the rest of the story. And he tells them what happened on the actual Swimming voyage, terrible enemies coming, sea monsters, dragging him down to the bottom of the ocean, thinking they're going to eat him, and he slices and dices them, etc. And he says, page five, uh, line 575, I have never heard of a harder night battle under heaven's vault, nor a more wretched man on the water stream, but I escaped alive, and I arrived in the land of the Finns. Brecca has never, nor you either, done a deed so bold and daring with his decorated blade. Now, probably what's going on here is what's called a flitting or a flit. Okay? This is a term from Old Norse. And what it refers to, and we see this a lot in Old Norse sagas. Somebody comes in and says, oh, I'm going to do something great for you. And then another person stands up and challenges the person. And it's a verbal challenge, and it is a means to get the person to essentially present your credentials. It's like, you know, can I have your wallet, please? May I see your ID? Show me your resume, Beowulf. Only this time, Unferth is saying, we've already heard your resume, and it sucks. <laughs> You're not very good. And Beowulf says, oh, no, 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 no. You read the unrevised, unfinished version. Okay? So he responds in like manner. He answers the flit. And usually, in Old Norse literature at least, what happens at this point? 
is everybody's fine. They sit down and drink and have a good time. Notice, however, what Beowulf does. He says, Brecca has never, nor have you, done a deed so bold and daring with his decorated blade. I would never boast of it. Though you became your brother's killer, you are next of kin. Remember that Germanic ethic? Duty to kin? Okay. <coughs> a major no-no in Germanic society is you never kill a member of your own family. And you never kill your lord. Cain, Abel. Okay. The feud, it starts there. Unferth, according to Beowulf, killed his own brother. So why is he sitting at Hrothgar's feet? He should be an outcast. Nobody should want this guy around. I mean, he is just bad news all the way around. And yet Hrothgar apparently allows him to sit there and be his advisor and counselor. There's supposed to be some parallelism between Unferf and Grindelwald. Probably. <laughs> I and mean, we'll talk about that later. I mean, the way I, I read the poem, there's a very good reason why Grindel comes. Because Unferf's there. It's almost like Unferth is the magnet attracting Grindel. After all, what did Hrothgar say? You know, God could stop Grindel anytime he wants. But he hasn't. And if something bad is happening, and it's continually happening, and you know that God could stop it, and you believe in God, and that God would stop it under the right conditions, then you have to ask yourself, what are the wrong conditions? What is wrong, she's a phrase from another work of literature. What is wrong in Denmark? What stinks in Denmark? Okay. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with Unferth sitting there. And then later on we're going to meet Hrothgar's nephew, Hrothulf. Bad blood. Really bad blood. There also. Okay. So we see at the heart of the Danish kingdom there is a fratricide. Unferth. Well, Grendel is a descendant of a fratricide. So he goes on. For that you needs must suffer punishment in hell. No matter how clever you are. See, he just went beyond the bounds of normal flitting. Normal flitting, nobody really gets hurt. Here... Maybe this wasn't public before, but Beowulf has just said publicly, oh, by the way, you have a guy sitting in the center of you who killed his brother. In Germanic society, that person becomes persona non grata. You don't, you don't accept them in. You, you don't pay the wear guilt for them. Okay? But he doesn't stop. I will say it truly, son of Edgelaf, never would Grindel have worked such terror that gruesome beast against your lord or shames and herod, if your courage and spirit were as fierce as you yourself fancy they are. If you were half the man you say you are, Grendel wouldn't be a problem. Woo! Now he's challenging his heroism. First he says, you killed your brother. Now he says, you're half a man, essentially. What else? But he has found, that is Grendel, has found that he need fear no feud, no storm of swords from the victory shieldings. Why does he call them victory shieldings at this point? It's beautiful sarcasm. It's irony, right? How victorious have they been for the last 12 years? So victorious that the hall stands empty every night. Okay, so what has he done? He's expanded his argument against not just Unferth. It's the whole Sh Shielding clan. If you guys were as manly as you say you are, as victory Shieldings as you say you are, Grendel wouldn't be a problem. No, no resistance at all from your nation. Now think about this. Is this a smart move on Beowulf's side? 
He's got himself, 14 other guys. They walk into Hrothgar's hall. Is Hrothgar totally without warriors? No. We're going to see them march off to Grindel's Mere later on. He's got plenty of men. And so it's kind of like, you know, Beowulf's now standing in the center, and there are these men all around, and they're like, did he just say what I think he said? Did he just say we're a bunch of wusses? And that's why Grindel's attacking us? He takes his toll, spares no one in the Danish nation, but indulges himself, hacks and butchers, and expects no battle from the Spear Danes. It's like their spears are all limp. <laughs> like their spears of broccoli or celery or something. But I will show him soon enough the strength and courage of the Geats in war. <coughs> Elevating himself, deflating, what would that word be? Not de-elevating, lowering. <laughs> lowering the Danes. He's not afraid of the Danes. We're going to show them how real men fight. We're going to show them how the Geats fight. Afterwards, let him who will go bravely to mead. Then you can drink to your heart's content. Why? Because he's already said, he, you guys are a bunch of drunks. That's why Grendel doesn't fear you. And Hrothgar's like, hey, where to go, Beowulf? I don't know if Hrothgar cheers him on because he didn't hear a word he said. <laughs> or if Hrothgar takes everything Beowulf said as part of this. Because in this, in the flicking exchange, you're not held responsible for what you say. It's all part of the game, as it were. Which is kind of, you know, cool, because it could mean, yeah, well, Hrothgar actually wears women's underwear. And maybe that's why Grindel's coming. Don't know that it's true, but, you know. <coughs> so, there's laughter. Hrothgar's queen comes in. She's adorned with gold. She fills, uh, offers Hrothgar the cup, and then she brings it to Beowulf. She thanks God, line 625. That her wish had come to pass, what was her wish? That she could rely on any Earl for relief from those crimes. The word in the Old English for relief is a turn. A turn, like we saw in that passage. If you can expect a turn, then you won't get thrust into the fire's embrace. And so Beowulf goes on. And says, I'm going to die. Um, I'm going to fight Grendel or I will die. Okay. And so strong words are spoken, etc. One warrior greets another. Be uh, Hrothgar offers drink and such. And then just before Fit 10. No, actually Fit 10. Hrothgar says, if you succeed, I'm going to give you treasure. More treasure than you can imagine. And so we're told, Troth Hrothgar and his troop of heroes, protector of the Shieldings, departed from the hall. The war chief wished to seek Wealthio, his queen's bedchamber. That's not what the text says. Okay? What the text says is... Why is that six sixty? Saw him Hrothgar, you what, mid his Halitha Yudrich, that is, with his troop of warriors, that's this right here, Eerder Schildinga, Ut of Halle, out of the hall, Wolde Wilfruma, Welthao second, he wished to seek. Now this could be. To seek Wealthiel, or to seek with Wealthiel, Queen to Yabedin. The Queen to Bed. So he's going to leave Beowulf to fight Grendel, and he's going to go off and have sex with his wife. Is there a problem with this image? Should he really be doing that while Beowulf's getting ready to fight Grendel? And so what does Beowulf do? 
he speaks some words to his men and says, I'm going to fight Grendel without any weapons. He hears that Grendel doesn't use a weapon, so I'm going to fight him without a weapon too. And what do his men think? He lays down. I mean, Beowulf says God's going to give the victory to whomever God chooses. It's all in his hands. And we're told, he lays down, and around him many a bold seafarer sank to his hall seat, hall rest. None of them thought that he should thence ever again seek his own dear home, homeland, his tribe, or the town in which he was raised. For they had heard it said that savage death had swept away far too many of the Danish folk in that wine hall. In other words, when they get ready to go to sleep, what are they thinking? We're not going to wake up. <coughs> We're just going to die. We're never going to go home. Now there is a parallel between this image and an image in Christianity. When Jesus and the disciples go up to Jerusalem the last time, mm -hmm. the disciples are thinking, We're dead. <laughs> We're all dead. None of us are going to live through this. But we'll go with them anyways. Okay? Does Beowulf think they're all dead? No. no. But notice what he does. We have the hall. Okay, classical what they would do. The benches and tables would be trestle tables. You break them apart. You push them up against the wall. You turn the benches on their side. And you lay down right here. Okay. And so you've got your doors down at this end. We have the fire here. Now there are 15 guys. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, let's say like seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Where do you not want to sleep? Five yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd be kicking, fighting, screaming to you know, be down here. Right? Where do you want Beowulf? You want him, you know, preferably sleeping here. <laughs> <laughs> On the outside of the door, you know, maybe leaning against it, sleeping, okay? Where does Beowulf sleep? Either here or here. He doesn't take the first bed. Why? So he can wake up. Okay. Yeah. So he can wake up. Why else? <laughs> well, that's cruel. <laughs> that's, but that's true. I mean, Beowulf tells us, or the poem tells us exactly what he does. Grendel comes in, he touches the doors, the doors burst open, he reaches down, he grabs the first guy, ow, gobbles him up. The guy's name is Han Shu, and we're <laughs> going to find out later. What is a Han Shu? A shoe you put on your hand is a glove. When Beowulf and the guys go back to the land of the gates, he tells Helak all about this, and he says, and they took Han Shu and they put him in a, the old English, Glove. Glove. Okay. That Grindel had made. Kind of interesting. Hanchu goes in a glove. I think that's Anglo Saxon humor. Might be lost <laughs> on us. Okay. But the poet tells us what does Beowulf do when Grindel reaches for Hanchu? Does he say, Nay, stop that vile creature? <laughs> he watches. Man, it really sucks being Hanchu. He's expendable. Beowulf watches Grendel to get an idea of his modus operandi, how he behaves. And then Grendel comes and reaches down for Beowulf, and Beowulf reaches up, hiya, <laughs> and the battle begins. All right? Got a few more minutes. Um, so Grendel comes in, and we get a long description of his, of his arriving. And we get this, these repetitious phrases. They're not necessarily formulas, but they are phrases that are repeated within the poem to describe Grindel's coming. And what one scholar says is that what the poet is doing is building up suspense. Okay? In the dark night he came creeping, the shadow goer. And then again, then from the moor in a blanket of mist, Grindel came stalking. And then again, um, to the hall came that warrior on his journey bereft of joys. Etc. Building it all up. 
He comes in. He and Bale will fight. Does Beowulf rip his arm off? Who rips his arm off? Grendel. Grendel rips his arm off of his body by trying to get away from Beowulf. He knows if he stays, he's a goner. Kind of like Jesus, you know, better enter heaven with one hand gone or one eye gone than to not enter at all. Okay? So Grendel, in trying to get away from Beowulf, allows his arm to be separated. And then goes away dripping blood and gore. And Beowulf hangs Grendel's arm up on the roof. So when everybody comes in, they're like, ew. <laughs> and we're told, you know, it's got nails like steel. So, I mean, it's pretty nasty. Okay? Um, fit 13. Morning arrives. Beowulf had fulfilled his boast, and they follow the tracks to the mere, the pond, or lake, where Grendel goes in, and they see the water bubbling up, and there's blood in it and everything. And then they ride back, and we're told there that Be uh, Grendel, line 851, laid down his life in his lair in the fen, his heathen soul, and hell took him. I guess he doesn't get to decide after he dies if he wants to go to be with heaven. And the old retainers turn their horses around and they ride back to Herod. And what do they do as they're riding? 856, they celebrate Beowulf's glory. It was often said that north or south, between the two seas, across the wide world, there was none better in the sky's expanse among shield warriors, nor more worthy to rule. Though they found no fault with their own friendly lord, gracious Hrothgar, but said he was a good king. So they're riding back, and they're singing about Beowulf, and they're praising Beowulf, and says, no one would make a better king than Beowulf. And then it's almost like the poet catches himself, or has them catch themselves. And they say, oh, but you know, Hrothgar, is, you know, he's a good king too. <laughs> Called damning with faint praise or praising with great damning, or something like that, okay? They let their horses prance, and then an old shope sings a song, and he compares Beowulf to someone. And I'm going to leave you with this. We're going to just mention this guy's name, and then we'll stop, and we'll pick up there. He compares Beowulf with Sigmund. Sigmund. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest heroes in Germanic literature that ever was. He often gets conflated with Siegfried yeah. mm -hmm. because of Wagner. Wagner, right? <laughs> great, great author, but you know, he doesn't have a story. <laughs> Siegmund, a dragon slayer. Mm -hmm. So Beowulf, killing a monster, gets immediately compared with a dragon. Right? This is going to be important because we're going to see Siegmund do something with a sword. And that might have a relevance for later on in Beowulf's battle against Grendel's mother. Okay, we'll stop there.